I got an amazing guest today, guys. His name is Nate Boyer. He's a retired Green Beret in the Special Forces and a retired NFL veteran. And after he retired from the NFL, he actually started an organization called MVP, Merging Vets and Players. And his organization actually brings together retired military guys with retired NFL guys and helps them work through similar issues that they're experiencing after retirement. He also just released a movie called MVP that discusses sort of the origin story of his organization and what the organization actually does. I really enjoyed it. I hope you guys do too, but most importantly, stay safe and be well. All right, everybody, I've got Nate Boyer here. Nate, thank you so much for joining, man. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me, brother. Yeah. So, um, you know, you're a you're a former military veteran in the Green Berets and then, you know, one of a few people that also went on to be, you know, an NFLer. So also an NFL veteran. Yeah. Um, so I think that your perspective um, is so invaluable, man, because you kind of get both of those sides, right? Both of those perspectives. I talked to, you know, a lot of my patients they're veterans and then they're also, you know, and then I also see NFL veterans too, right? So, but I think as you've identified with a lot of the work you're doing from the organization you started to the movie that you put out, um, there's a lot of overlap in between what those two groups are experiencing. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the main similarity is just the, the camaraderie in the locker room. Um, and I think that stems from both of these worlds, whether you wore camouflage or a jersey, um, and, and, and a certain amount of sacrifice to become elite at something, right? Like, uh, and kind of pouring your whole life into it. Like, not a lot of jobs out there really feel like your whole identity. Um, and part of that is that uniform that you wear. Uh, but I think in the military and in, in professional sports, with both of those career is ending pretty young. Like typically you kind of peak physically anyway, you know, in your twenties. Right. And, and then feeling that feeling after that, where you, you know, you feel like your greatest days are behind you and you're, you still got three quarters of your life left or right. whatever. Right. Um, it's tough. It's tough to, to kind of grips with that. And, um, and it's high octane and the, and the, um, the adrenaline and all those things that we feel, you know, whether it's in a stadium of a hundred thousand people or, you know, on the battlefield with bullets cracking over your head, you kind of feel more alive in some of those moments than anywhere else. And the, the quiet that comes after that is, is, is a deafening quiet, you know? Yeah. And, and it's, it can be really hard. And, and oftentimes we try to make that transition alone uh, which can be a dangerous thing as well. And we feel like, oh, I, I want to push away from that community because I feel uh, inadequate or guilty or um, just like like a loser, you know, and that I just don't belong anymore. And now, and I definitely don't belong in the real world here. So like, where do I belong? Who am I? And that that's sort of a similar um, experience as well with both those groups. Yeah. You know, something that I've, that actually studies I've identified specifically in NFL veterans is one of the primary factors that ends up leading to adverse like mental health outcomes in the long run for these guys is not having a plan after retirement or, um, retirement just occurring suddenly, right. Whether that's, you know, due to an injury or um, due to the fact that you just don't pick up a contract, right? Um, and it seems like, you know, I don't think a top of my mind, you know, no studies like that have been done with the military veterans, but you can see how that would also happen with military vets, right? Where, you know, you're medically discharged or, you know, something happens where you just don't go back into duty and then you know, frankly, you just get kind of spit out the other end and then, you know, now you're stateside and it's just like, okay, like, you know, what am I doing? So certainly I can see how, you know, both of those contexts would apply to both of these groups, right? Yeah, you know, it, it's it's interesting. Um, in some ways, uh, the the end of the career with the athlete is more unexpected and kind of more, um, th there's less of an opportunity to, to prepare for that just because of the fact that most 
most people in sports, it you know, at least if they're playing at a high level in professional sports, it doesn't end on your terms. Right. Nine times out of 10, you get cut, you get released, you don't make the team the next year. Uh, and you, you weren't ready for that. Like in the military, aside from the injuries, right? Like, I mean, of course, there are circumstances that change that. Somebody get, you get, you get injured um, or, so, you know, something happens either struggling with the, um, you know, from a psychological space or physical space, whatever that is. Usually though, we know when our list enlistment ends, like we sign up for five years okay. and at the end of the five years, we can reenlist for two more years or whatever we want to do uh, and continue on. And maybe it won't be in the capacity we want, you know, maybe we will no longer be uh, in the fight as we had in the past, especially in like special operations. A lot of these guys like myself that joined, we joined at a time of war and we wanted to go to war. Like that's why we signed up. We wanted to do the mission and we wanted to have the most difficult challenge, most austere environment. Like, give me all that. Like, this is, this is why I signed up. I want, uh, I, I want to compete, you know, honestly in, in this space. And, and, you know, athletes feel that way too. Like they want to, they want to compete. They want to win. Um, give me an obstacle uh, and I want to overcome it. But in, in the military, you don't traditionally, you, you don't necessarily get cut. You know, yeah. it, it does happen if you're not pulling your weight, if you're not doing the job correctly, it does happen. But I'd say it swings the other way. It's like nine times out of 10. It is on your terms, timeline wise, like you are able to somewhat kind of prepare, but we don't do it because we're not taught that that's important. Like it's the focus is retention. Keep the guys in, keep the, you know, stay on a mission, focus on what you're doing right now. Don't think about what's down the road. Right. Think about what's happening right now. Uh, in front of you and that there's value in that like i understand that especially on the battlefield you can't be thinking about other stuff you know yeah. you can't be you can't be in that headspace you're going to get complacent something bad's going to happen it's going to be on you because at the end of the day it's all about the man on your left and right and like keeping them safe but you know when you're back in garrison uh when you're not on deployment like you should be kind of thinking about slash preparing for the future you know on uh on my deployment to iraq about halfway through things slowed down a bit like our op tempo we kind of had a lull in in some of the fighting and and that's when i started thinking about college and preparing to play football and all that stuff so i i think i was lucky that i had that passion and drive and i knew what i wanted to do next where a lot of guys they don't they don't know they, they don't think about it they're just like well i'm just going to do this till i can't i'll figure it out then and then all of a sudden that day comes and you're like Oh man, <laughs> I actually have no idea what I want to do. I have right. no idea. Yeah, that, that's what I'm good at or yeah. what I'm into. Yeah. Well, you do know what you're good at, right? You're you're good at like whether you're a military veteran, you're good at being in the military and being on the battlefield. If you're an athlete, you're good at being on the ball field, whatever ball field that is, right? Um, I just think both of those environments, um, whether purposeful or not purposeful, they still breed a sort of environment where it's not for like future thinking. You know what I mean? Whether that is because at, yeah. because it's out of necessity on the battlefield, right? Or um as an athlete, right? It's just it's just not something that is necessarily uh focused on as part of the like the greater league or organization, right? Because you know, what does it what does it benefit the organization to make sure that you're going to be okay after you leave their organization? Right? Yeah. No, I mean, that's, yeah, they're, they're both, both those, you know, both those worlds, those organizations, the, the, the military, uh, professional sports. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think anywhere, I mean, any business and industry, it's like, it's a business, right, you know, right, I mean? right, right. The, the intent is to um, uh, have that desired outcome and yeah. that result as a group, as a, as a larger organization. It's not necessarily, individually focused and i and i get that and and it, it you know and, and we're not taught that yeah in team sports at least and in the military it isn't about you the individual you know what i mean it's right. about the mission it's about the team it's about the ultimate uh goal the desired effect on the batter, battlefield or the ball field or whatever so I, I absolutely get that and there's nothing wrong with that um at some level it does come down to the individual athlete and the individual veteran to think about that stuff um but we need those resources and and those mentors and those people uh, that have walked that walk, that have been there, that understand that. 
to sort of assist in that transition and bring awareness to that uh, and also push the military and professional sports, you know, teams, leagues uh, to enhance the importance of that. And, and it, I think it's happening more and more, you know, the more that players are speaking out and, and even veterans in some way about the importance of life after the uniform uh, and, and, you know, what, where that value still lies and, and that very rarely do we get to, to sort of ride out on that white horse in a perfect scenario, like Lionel Messi just did today. You know what I mean? Like That's why we were delayed, have... ladies and just for the audience. That's why we we're a little bit delayed on this recording because we, uh, Nate and I have priorities. And when the World <laughs> Cup final is on, we know we got to well, watch that. It was first. supposed to be over <laughs> by the time we started this and yeah. went into extra time and then PKs. I mean, Mbappe. 2 billion people around the world were watching it. So right, they all right. know what we're talking 2 billion about. and 2 people. Yeah, 2 billion watching. and 2. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I, I really do want to get into um, – very briefly or as deep as you want to get um when you retire from the military you mentioned that actually when you were overseas you were thinking about going to college um were you already thinking that you were going to walk on try to walk on at ut when you were over there or was that something that after you got to college you decided to do like what what was that thought process yeah i i i was in iraq this is in 2000 so I, 2008 and into 2009 towards the end of the deployment I started training for I started doing football training because I was like you know what I'm gonna go to college and I'm gonna go try out for the football team it was something I'd never done I didn't play Pop Warner I didn't play in high school uh football was always my sp favorite sport but I never played an organized down in my life and, right. and I like regretted that so it just bothered me you know I was like man I gotta at least try like <laughs> I, you know, I was 28 years old when I made the decision. I was 29 years old when I actually went to college. And, uh, so I started, I started training over there. And, uh, the reason Texas came about, I, I you know, I, I knew I wanted to go somewhere. And originally I was thinking, you know what, I've never played before. Maybe I'll start at a junior college or a smaller school and, you know, see how that works out. And one of my good friends that I was deployed with Brad keys, uh, who unfortunately passed away in 2012. Uh, he was like, dude, wherever you go, man, um, or whatever, you, you, you first of all, you, you got to go to a big school. You got to go to a, you got to go to a big program. Like it's going to, it's going to bother you if you don't, if you sell yourself short or, um, you know, if you do end up making it and, and doing okay, you, you'll wonder like, well, what if I would have, you know, went to that big fish and, and, uh, and it was like, you know, he was right. He, he was right. He knew me well enough to know that that would bother me. So I started thinking about where would that be? I knew I wanted to go to a traditional program. Um, and I didn't want to go to school back in California. I grew up in the Bay Area, lived in Southern California, a little after high school, San Diego and L.A. And I was like, I just want to live somewhere different, kind of do something different for college. And then I'll probably end up back in Southern California because I knew down the road in the future that I wanted to pursue uh the film and television industry. Right? right. But I thought, you know, there's no rush on that. Let's, let's try something else. Let's go somewhere else. And I'd been to Austin, Texas one time, loved it. It was a great city. Uh, had a good time. Felt like as an older student, I would maybe fit in pretty well. I know Texas is very good to their veterans. And also like the, the you know, the Texas Longhorns, it's just, it's one of those historic programs. Um, it's a great university as well. Uh, but beyond that, like, it's just, it's just one of those teams, like that logo is maybe the most uh, recognizable uh, collegiate sports logo uh, around the world, you know, the Longhorn. Uh, I saw it in, in Iraq all over the place. Like, you see it in movies, Chris Kyle in American Sniper wears the Longhorn hat, you know right. what I mean? And, and he did in real life, too. Um, Marcus Luttrell's from Texas, you know, mm -hmm. from Lone Survivor. And so... He, uh, you know, he, he's, he's, a, he's, I think he's a tech fan or something, but anyway, uh, but you've got, you know, these, the, you, you see it in the barracks hanging from windows. Cause there's so many people in the army that are from Texas. Uh, my team sergeant had a longhorn hat that he would wear on deployment. Uh, I had an interpreter once I had a Texas, Texas longhorns t-shirt. He knew nothing about what it was, but somehow it ended up over there and he thought it was cool. He liked the logo. And I was like, man, all the signs are pointing to, to Austin. So 
that's the only place I applied. Um, and I went out there and, you know, the only reason I made the team in tryouts was that I was in good condition from the military and they knew, all right, well, this guy, he'll, he'll probably never get off the scout team, but he's going to give everything he has every practice. He's going to help us prepare for games. He'll get run over with dignity time and time again and bounce right back up and, you know, get back in there. And, uh, it takes its toll on you, anybody, you know, even if you're coming from the military, it's tough to <laughs> just get owned over and over by these athletes that are much better than you, especially when they're 10 years younger than you. But I was good with it, you know, to at least get my shot, get my foot in the door and then figure out a way eventually on the field. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I'm wondering from, from that, that's an interesting perspective because, you know, I'm wondering, did you pursue that consciously or subconsciously because maybe you felt that um, there would be some overlap between some of the camaraderie or whatever that you experienced in the military that then you would sort of transition into into football you know what I mean yeah if I didn't really think about it I, I honestly I I didn't think about how much I would need that camaraderie in that locker room and that identity um with a uniform and the structure that comes with playing right you know college football I didn't think about it I didn't realize it until after football was over and then I was out of the I was done with the military I was done with football and I had no uniform because while I was in college I stayed in the Texas National Guard and deployed two more times okay so in the summer I went to Afghanistan a couple of times hold on so you were going so you yeah. were playing football during the fall and then you were going off to Iraq and Afghanistan to serve as a Green Beret in the summer? Yeah, I would. Uh, I mean, I took classes in the spring as well. We had spring ball. Right. And then I would take my finals early um, and leave in sometime in April. And then I'd come back in August and, and right back into training camp. So that's crazy, yeah. man. I mean, like yeah. what <laughs> how <laughs> I mean, just what, what does that do for you from a competitive standpoint? Like. I was just a green beret in Afghanistan. And then you come in and then you're competing on the football field. That's crazy. Man, I loved it. I, I, I think it was also a time in my life, you know, I was in my early thirties. Um, I felt like I was in some of the best shape of my life and I loved the op tempo of it. Um, also like being in school, being back home, I would get a little bit stir crazy. And I think it's a mix of, you know, most of my, a lot of my friends are friends I made in college. So I have a lot of friends that are, that are a good amount younger than me. I'm 41 now. And, yeah. you know, most of my friends I'd say are in their, you know, on average, probably early thirties, early mid thirties, but like, uh, like I think being an older student understand, and also having already been in the military for five years before I went to college and being used to that, you know, kind of grind overseas and, and then coming home and preparing for that again. And I was just sort of in that mode. Um, and, and I think I missed the service element too, and the, the mission and like some of the, honestly, some of the, some of the danger and adventure that comes with it. Not that football, there is an adventure or danger, like there is at some level, but a bit more of the unknown. Um, and and I just was like, well, I still got left some left in the tank to give. Also, like maybe I'm giving somebody a break that's been deployed way more than me, that's got a family and stuff. And I'm a, I was a single, you know, I am a single, single dude. Um, why not just volunteer as long as I can get back in time for football? Right. <laughs> so I think being in the special forces helped that. And I know it did because I had people, um, up the chain that made sure that, that they liked the fact that I was in the guard. I was a part of the army still, but that I was playing college football. It was good. It's good for their brand as well to right. show like, look, look, you know, you don't, we, we serve a variety of different people and you know, we have a lot of different people with different uh, talents and um, desires and, and passions that are amongst our ranks. And, you know, Nate's one of them. So they they had a vested interest in getting me back as well and having me continue to play. So it all sort of worked out. I mean, it was busy, but that first summer after uh, in college, before I re-enlisted, uh, I was bored out of my mind. I was like 
foot, you know, foot during the summer, you don't really do much with the football team. You got some workouts, but nothing's mandatory. And I was just like bouncing at a bar in downtown Austin and just not really feeling it, you know, to yeah. be completely honest. Um, and I was just like, man, I, I miss that team. I miss that uniform. Uh, and so, you know, in the spring I, I reenlisted and, and, uh, and ended up, yeah, like I said, going back overseas. Yeah. Uh, I, actually, four more times. Two of them were deployments. The other two were training missions to Greece and Bulgaria. But, uh, but yeah, every summer I went somewhere. Yeah. And one thing, man, I was talking to um, Alexander Young. He's a um, he's a psychiatrist at the West LA VA, and I think he was the you know the the head of the neuropsychiatric hospital at UCLA. And I was trying to hone down like what is it that the military veterans like need the most. And they need a lot, right? But one thing that he really harped on was the need for meaningful work, right? So it's not just like tasks on task rabbit, you know, is, is the example that he gave. Not just like, you know, going and just doing stuff that doesn't really mean much to them. It has to be right. stuff that they feel is really meaningful that they're doing, right? And I just wonder if your move into college, your move into football did you, did that help? Did that feel meaningful to you? Did you feel a sense of purpose behind that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, football, I know it's a sport, but just like we were watching the world cup today, man, sports matter, yeah, <laughs> you know, clearly they really do. Yeah. They bring people together. Um, at the end of the day, maybe it seems silly. It's like we're out there on a field with a ball trying to score points, you know, yeah. more points than the other team. I mean, it's a game, but there's just something about it that's just really uniting and um and it's athletes are we a lot of us look up to athletes they're inspiration to us and they have a platform and opportunity to do more than just play the game so there all of that stuff was appealing to me but i mean a big part of it was yeah just just competing yeah and uh the, the feeling you have you know when you're on the field in a game and 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 every you know every play matters and and you're you know you're alongside these other men uh, on your left and right, similar to the military, of course, like it's not life and death, but you know, you do feel that same sense of camaraderie and connection and um, like what you're doing matters. And, and, you know, so it's a, it's a special thing. It, it, it really helped me transition. I didn't know it. I didn't know it would, um, but it ended up definitely helping with me coming out of the military and, and into the next phase. And that's interesting because you just contrasted it yourself, right? Earlier when you were like, but then I was bouncing at a, at a bar in Austin and you were just like, you know, what am I doing? Right. You're getting bored. And you did have the option to redeploy both physically and mentally. It sounds like, so you did, but you know, I'm wondering what if you hadn't had that option, right? Like, yeah. It, yeah. I don't it, know. I yeah. Mean, hopefully I would have found something, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure. Yeah. So that, that time in the guard was good for me where it was, you know, they call it citizen soldier where you're, st where you're, you're, you're part civilian and right. you're part uh, soldier still. And, you know, it, 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 it lessened the blow of the transition at some level. Sure. And then as if you couldn't have accomplished enough just by like walking on and you actually started at UT, which is crazy. Um, but then you went on and you got drafted by the Seahawks. So, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, I, I started at long snapper, so it's right. not as, you know, I wasn't the quarterback or, uh, the, you know, the slot the, receiver, strong safety. I walked yeah. on as a safety, but I wasn't fast enough or athletic enough and didn't know the game well enough to ever really get on the field and play meaningful snaps. Right. So I started, I started long snapping because, you know, I, I pitched in high school growing up playing baseball and, had a pretty decent arm and um, was a good basketball player, like not great, but good, you know, a good shooter where you need that, that touch and that accuracy. And it's similar in a lot of ways to snapping a ball. Um, I mean, you're hanging upside down and trying to throw a tight spiral 15 yards behind you between your legs uh, to a pretty I don't know, consistent spot. And, um, you know, it's just one of those thankless jobs that, you could do it 500 times in a row. Perfect. But if you screw it up once, you're the bad guy. Yeah. And, uh, I didn't mind that type of pressure. I mean, it, it, thankless jobs. That's, that's like all we do in the military <laughs> at time. I mean, people say thank you when you come home, but the men and women you're serving alongside, they don't say thank you. They don't, <laughs> you're like, that's your job. Do your job. Right, you know, right. it's like, uh, 
and so it was uh it was something i was i was used to i was happy to do i was like if it means getting on the field then i'm in and so i started messing with it actually when i was overseas um i i, I took a couple of footballs with me and was practicing and came home and and you know and, and won the starting job were you long slant you, you, you were long snapping to the afghans not to them, just like into, uh, you know, I built a target out of plywood, actually. Can we say that? We, can them. we say that you were? Yeah, <laughs> you just did. <laughs> they definitely came out and watched me a couple of times. You know, they were very confused, like what I would, why what I was you doing? My legs yeah. <laughs> snapping it into a piece of plywood. Yeah. You know, not that exciting. Um, but, but yeah. So yeah. then, then in this, the, the draft rolled around in 20, 15 i put on a bunch of weight to try to get that shot in the nfl and uh didn't get drafted but signed as a undrafted free agent with the seahawks and you know went up there uh was up there for about four or five months total uh in in the off season otas um you know rookie mini camp um training camp preseason got to play in one preseason game uh and it was just an incredible experience man to I mean, the Seahawks had been to back-to-back -back Super Bowls. It was another one of those decisions I had to make. It was between them and the St. Louis Rams, um, I think a year or two before they moved to L.A. And so but back then, they, they were not good. Well, they're not very good this year either. But, uh, you know, they were – it was like kind of – I mean, they were 4-12, and 12 and the Seahawks, like I said, back-to-back -back Super Bowl appearances, one winning one of them. I just couldn't turn that down. I thought about Brad, you know, right. in that moment. I was right. like, I got to go here. And uh, it was awesome. I mean – even the game I played in, I did, I did great. It just came down as the next round of big cuts and you only keep one long snapper and the guy I was going up against, you, you know, was just, he was better than me. Yeah. Um, he's bigger than me. He's better than me. He was younger than me. It was all those things. So, yeah. You know, it made sense, but uh, I was happy to just get that opportunity. This is going to sound like a stupid question and it probably is, but was there ever like a moment where you had to make the decision to be like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go for this. I'm going to go to try to get drafted by the NFL doing this. Like, you know, and if so, you know, why did you make that decision? I mean, it's everyone's, was it a dream? Was it, you know, anything specific or. Yeah. I mean, I graduated from college. I didn't have any eligibility left. Um, and I was done doing that. I moved out to LA uh, did an internship to finish my master's degree. I uh, interned with Peter Berg actually at Film 44, which is a, uh, you know, Pete made nice. Lone Survivor yeah. and Friday Night Lights and, you know, football and military related stuff. And while I was out there, you know, right before I'd gone out there, actually, I played in a senior all star game in Charleston, South Carolina. And a bunch of the NFL scouts there were like, man, you got to put some weight on, but you should go for it. You know, you, you're, nice. you're a good snapper. Yeah. And so I did, I just, I, I put on like 30 pounds in about four months um, and was doing the internship training at Unbreakable Performance Center, which is Jay Glazer's gym yeah. where we eventually started MVP. And then I got the, uh, you know, the draft rolled around and both the Rams and Seahawks offered me and I took the Seahawks, you know, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I was up to Seattle the next day. So then you leave the NFL and it sounds like, did you already have plans for what you were going to be doing after the NFL or did that? Yeah. You know, I mean, kind I, of moment I was 19 when I first became interested in film and TV. Right. Moved from, I was working on a fishing boat in San Diego, left that, moved to LA, you know, took some acting classes, was looking at film schools and then 9-11 happened and I didn't join right away, but it, it kind of got me thinking outside of what I was doing. And I just didn't feel compelled at the time to continue down the film and TV path and eventually join the military. And, you know, just sort of, so I sort of just pushed pause on all that um, and circled back on it. Like, you know, 12 years later. Right. Yeah. Um, so then, then you start this organization called MVP for everyone listening. Um, it's called, it's, it stands for merging vets and players. Right. And, yep. you know, maybe you can describe it a little bit, but from my perspective and from what I do, I think it's absolutely amazing. Do you want to kind of describe what you all yeah. do a little bit? Yeah. MVP, like you said, stands for merging vets and players. We bring together combat vets and former professional athletes and we help them find purpose uh, and identity when they lose a the uniform. So a lot of the things we've just been talking about, uh, figuring out who you are next, what you want to, how you want to transfer all that energy and skill set, uh, like 
you know, what does that look like? I mean, some guys and girls that are part of our program um, are in a very bad place when they get to us. And some of them are just like, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, who I am now and what, what I even want to do. And some of them are in a, in a good place and they just miss the camaraderie. They just miss the locker room. They right. miss the team. Right. You know, it's a, it's a various, it's a varied group, but it's all, all former pro athletes and combat vets. And, you know, we just have a mutual respect for one another and, you know, some shared experiences and um, it's peer to peer coaching. We meet up in the gym every week. We train together um, for about 30, 45 minutes. It's nothing too crazy, you know, get a good sweat going. And then we transition to the wrestling mats and we huddle up and, and we just talk and it's, it's, it's peer to peer coaching open forum, you know, everybody's a coach in there. Everybody's also, uh, worth, uh, you know, sharing their story and, and like the value and, in, in what people share and the struggles that they share, but also the wins that they share. It's just good to hear all that stuff. And, and, you know, we sort of save each other at the end of the day. Um, and, and yeah, we, we, we now are we're in eight cities around the country now. Uh, and the website for people that want to learn more about it is vets and players.org. Yeah. Um, you mentioned identity and certainly that's lost in a lot of the military veterans. That's what I hear a lot for a lot of my guys that come in and, and talk to me. It's, you know, they're, they're just so attached to this identity of, of what they've, and it's like an intense identity, right? Not only for who you are as a person, as a military member, but then also who you are to the, the other military guys that you're with to your right and your left. Right. right. And then when, you know, you're not in that state in that state anymore. It's really hard to identify, you know, who's to my right and to my left. And then who am I? Right. Um, I'm just wondering if you could like speak about that a little bit about that loss of identity that I hear so commonly. And like, you know, and like you noted, it's like an overlapping feature between, um, the football guys or athletes. And then also the military veterans. I think it's like a, such a key focal point in what you're doing, uh, with that overlapping feature, trying to address that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, the reality is like, we're not, we're not the uniform we wear. I mean, that's the best way of putting it. Yeah. The, we, we, we associate that because society does. And also we feel such a strong pull to that, like athletes and vets often times it's, you know, it's, 6 a.m. to whenever the night ends is that thing, yeah. um, your job. And, you know, the way that you eat, train, prepare, everything has to do with success on the battlefield or the ball field. Um, so you feel that that is who you are. And the reality is it's not. You're not the uniform you wore. You're the person who puts it on every day and who is willing to sacrifice so much and kind of outwork the world to get where you're at. Like that's who you are. You can, you can take, get rid of that uniform. You're still that person. You still, you know, that, that that's still who you are. Um, and you can put on any uniform or no uniform and transfer that, um, you know, that mentality and that way of being into something else. I mean, it, it, it's kind of as simple as that, although it's not easy to do. Right. You know, it's simple. Yeah. But. And that's interesting because like, when you're in active duty or when you're actively an athlete, like thinking like that is really beneficial, right? Like I'm a freaking green beret and this is what we do. Right. Or, you know, I'm an NFL wide receiver and this is like what I do and this is what we do and this is what we're good at. And this is what we're, what, right. what we're going to work towards. Right. But then afterwards that can be detrimental. Right. So I've found that a lot of the psychologists that I work with are like, well, we need to reframe that a little bit so that, you know, well, you got to start reframing, th thinking about what you are now, right? You're, are, are you a father, right? Are you a brother? Are you a sister? Are you someone's son, right? We're taking that energy and that intensity and then working towards being the best form of that that's possible. You know, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's it. That's, it's, it's really just believing that and it's not easy to do. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we're very hard on ourselves. Uh, I think athletes and veterans, I mean, people in general often can be, but very competitive people are very, very tough on themselves. Um, and I think it, that's an important thing to do is give yourself a little bit of credit, recognize um, how far you've come, even if the scoreboard at the end of the day and the result isn't what you hoped for. 
you know, th that recognition of, of what you put into it and how you played the game uh, or essentially how you live your life and how you're living your life and what you're doing and the people that you're inspiring and helping along the way, like all that stuff's important. You know, that's a big thing in the military. It's a survivor's guilt and not remembering how many people you were a part of potentially saving, but only remembering those that you couldn't right. and focusing on that. And it's, it's tough, man. It's hard to do. It's not, <laughs> it's easy to say, it's easy to coach. It's not, it's difficult to execute though individually. So it's just one of those things that we try to encourage a lot through MVP. Um, you know, being pr proud of your scars, proud of all that stuff too, but also proud of the good that you did and the good that you're trying to do. Right. And one thing like you, I'm so impressed because I, you know, just from the outside looking in, right. We, we're like, what, like 37 minutes into this conversation. We've met before a little bit, but just, there's just element of resiliency to you that I don't think is very universal. Um, and I think a lot of people, including myself, could really, you know, benefit from, right? Where it's like, I, I feel like a lot of these people, even including myself, man, at, at transition points, we tend to stall and stagnate, right? Whereas you, like listening to a lot of the stuff that you've gone through, there's always, it's like always moving forward, always at all times, right? What's the next thing? You know, it always, I mean, it seems like that, right? Based on, yeah, like I right. said, right? Like it's like 37 minutes into a combo right now. But I'm just wondering, you know, is there anything underlying in that mindset that you're bringing to the table that's always having you move forward onto college, onto walk on at UT, onto the Seattle Seahawks, onto film and TV, onto starting MVP? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know what that is, or why, why I'm like that. Uh, I haven't really examined that. <laughs> Uh, I just, I just love the unknown. Um, I love adventure. I love competing. I love, uh, proving people wrong, you know, proving myself wrong. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why that is, but I am definitely a very forward thinking person. I'm always kind of preparing for the next thing. Yeah. Um, it's not always a good thing because you don't enjoy where you're at often mm -hmm. you're just thinking about where I could be and where I should be and where will I be next yeah so some people are stuck in the past a lot of vets deal with that a lot of athletes deal with that you mm -hmm. know the, the good old days the glory days yeah um, I'm the opposite I'm like I'm stuck in the future and so it, it's I guess it's positive in some way because you know, I'm focused more on post-traumatic growth than I am post-traumatic stress and stress. And like, how can I transfer, you know, all this stuff, like the lessons I've learned, the losses, uh, how can that make me better? Um, but also I, you know, I, I struggle with being present, you know, and, yeah. and kind of just in, enjoying life and, yeah. and where I'm at. And that's something that I need to continue to work on. Yeah. And I think that's a, uh, that's great. And, and thanks for identifying that. The fact that, you know, you're, Although you might look like a superhero, you're not, <laughs> you're not actually, you know, like no one, no one's perfect, right? Everyone's dealing with their own thing and everyone has yeah. certainly a lot of room for growth. Definitely. Um, now MVP is an, an amazing organization. I love the fact, you know, cause there's a lot of like, um, like community groups, right? Where a lot of vets can go and they can just kind of talk, but there's this really interesting aspect, obviously of the athletes. Right. But then in addition to that, y'all like do some pretty intense exercise and, and you said you get on the mats and stuff like that. Um, was there a specific re I love that. Uh, just because aerobic exercise has just been shown to be so beneficial for mental health, but is there any other specific reason why you guys implemented that? I think it just helps bond us and kind of open, open you up a little bit. You right. know, you tend to be a little more vulnerable with somebody if you've gone through something together. Yeah. And even though it's not like we, you know, played this epic football game or went through training camp together or went through, you know, special forces training or basic training or whatever that is where that can bond you at a higher level. Yeah. It's at least something that we do together every week. And you know, everybody else on that mat, they went through that same workout and they put themselves out there and they're, you know, they, um, they sort of exhausted themselves to an extent. Uh, and I think it gets the endorphins going and, and it makes us feel a little more connected, but also, it kind of puts our guard down a little bit yeah and and that's important you know like we want everyone to feel comfortable in there everything we talk about stays on the mat 
and that's important to know but also like we don't want people to feel um, uncomfortable if they've got something that they need to get off their chest we want them to feel empowered to do that and you know knowing that everybody else in there has your back and like we're, we're gonna we're gonna get through this workout together and then we're gonna get through this conversation together as well awesome that's an awesome way to put it and then we got to talk about this new thing that you did you so you started you directed correct me if i'm wrong you directed you're the lead actor and you produced a, a movie called mvp it's yeah yeah it's, the, it, uh, yeah go ahead describe it for me please do it <laughs> just say it was, <laughs> it was 2020 uh in the fall and you know we're mid-pandemic we i'd started co-writing this thing a couple of years before that uh, with a buddy of mine who's also a veteran and we we just you know we thought oh one day this will be a movie um, he actually came to me with the idea that it was a movie, like how MVP started. And um, we were just kind of working on it. And, and as things just kept staying closed and locked down and isolated, I was like, man, I, you know what? I'm just going to work on this thing. I'm going to get it to a place where we can shoot it. As soon as COVID ends, we'll get out there and do it. And then the second wave hit. And then I found out that the Veterans Homeless Shelter um, that's on Sunset Boulevard in East Hollywood was closing down and we were allowed to shoot there. They told us we could film on location at this place, but they're closing down end of September, 2020 and October one, it was going to be taken over by a different group and they were going to kind of tear it up and change it. And it wasn't going to be for vets anymore because they lost funding. And I was like, man, we got to go shoot that now. This was like in July. So we just made the decision to go and do it. And, we uh, gathered together a bunch of vets and athletes and we, we made this movie. Every veteran portrayed on screen is played by an actual vet. All the athletes uh, or most of the athletes are played by real professional athletes like Randy Couture, Tony Gonzalez, right. Michael Strahan, Howie Long have a cameo in it. Yep. Jay Glazer is in it, of course. Um, and it's about a Marine who's living in a homeless shelter and he meets an NFL player first year out of the league. And they're both going through the same struggles of trying to figure out who they are, you know, losing that identity. Um, so it's really about how MVP started. All the characters are sort of composite characters from our organization. And the script was written by, yeah, it was, it was written, put to, pen to paper by myself and, and, and Garrett Jones, who's my co-writer. But it was all just the real stories of these people and words that have been shared on the mat in those huddles. Um, so we kind of all made this thing together. And then on set, most of the crew were veterans. Every department head, except for the cinematographer, was a veteran. Um, and we made this thing for nothing, you know, and movie money, like just nothing. And, and uh, but we got it done. And not only got it done, like we, we made something pretty special. Uh, Sylvester Stallone put his name on it as an executive producer. Yep. Wiz Khalifa gave us a, an original song to use in the film. Nice. Like people just wanted to help, you know, because they love what MVP is all about, the organization. And they know our, it was important to get our story out there and get it told. So, so now it's available everywhere, video on demand, you know, Amazon Prime, Apple TV, uh, wherever. Yeah. Uh, so I, I encourage people to to watch it, to review it. That's really important to throw those reviews up because it really helps it get further up the line so people can find it that wouldn't hear this message and wouldn't know about the movie otherwise. Um, and we just really want to get it out to the veteran athlete community so they can learn more about who we are, um, but also maybe connect to the story in some way. Yeah. Is that now... Is that your primary purpose for doing the movie, you would say, is to kind of get the story out there, um, bring some of the military veterans into the organization or into the community that might not have known about it? Yeah, I'd say that's a primary focus. I mean, also, all these people that we're working on, they want to work in this. They want to they want to make films. They want to tell stories. You know, I mean, yeah. all those like I said, all those vets on screen played by actual vets, most of them don't have a ton of acting experience, but they're interested in it, you know, and they wanted to be a part of that. And then we've got Dan Loria, who was the dad on the wonder years. And, uh, you know, he played Vince Lombardi on Broadway. He's in it and he, he's a Vietnam vet, you know? And, yeah. and so like, he's been in hundreds of things, but you just had this variety of people that all had a shared experience from the veteran and athlete side who came together to make this thing. And I mean, that's what was truly special about it uh, is that people just, they gave so much um, 
their time, their energy, uh, their expertise. Uh, and, and we just kind of took a chance on each other and got it done. How much of your personal experience did you bring in to the movie, writing the script, directing it, different things like that? Was it personal experience? Was it, yeah. it was it people like, you know, other guys that, you know, in their experience, or was it a little bit of both? Well, it's not my story by any means. Um, but especially with, with, with some of the stuff on screen, some of the acting, um, and even some of the, the writing and the things that we say and, and the feelings that we have, those are based on things I've felt and, and, and heard. Um, but it's, like I said, it's not my story, but I mean, I think when you're playing any character, um, I, I, you know, as an, as an actor, as a, uh, an entertainer or whatever, you got to bring yourself to the project. You got to right. bring, bring, you know, if it's not you up there, um, and you're trying to just be somebody else, at least in my experience, it's, it, it, it's tough. You know, it's hard. That's that's hard to do. I'm not good at that. I'm 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 okay at being me, um, but I don't think I'd be great at, at trying to be somebody else. So, you know, once the camera's rolling, and yeah, I'm saying these words, and it's this person's backstory and all that. It's my thoughts. It's my feelings. It's my emotion, um, and my connection to those to those words. Uh, and to that situation scenario, even if I've never actually lived that exact thing. Uh, that's what's important. That's what people want to watch. And that's what people want because they want to feel connected to that. They want to feel um, that you're being honest and genuine and that that's really you up there. They want to watch you right. um, going through this this experience. And so that's what I was trying to do. That's what I think a lot of us were trying to do. I mean, I was just so proud of the performances from everybody. I mean, Tony Gonzalez and Randy Couture, uh, you know, two of the greatest to do it at their respective sports. You know, Tony's maybe the greatest tight end of all time, 17 year career, hall of famer, first ballot, Randy Couture, six time heavyweight champion of the world in the UFC. And they're up there telling their own stories in their own words. Um, but in like a, you know, in a scripted format, but just like pouring themselves out and be like, this is who I am. This is who, I, this is what I went through. And it's cool, man. It's just really cool to, to see that. And then you've got these veterans on the mat listening to that. And yeah, it's scripted and they're actors, um, but they've also lived that world from the veteran side. And they're just like genuinely drawn in and connected to the words that Tony and Randy are saying and their, the stories that they're telling and feeling that connectedness it was just really special to be able to capture that um, in a film that's, you know, like I said, it's, 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 it's fictionalized in the sense of it's, um, it's, it's scripted and, and, uh, and all that, but it just felt very raw and, and, and genuine while it was happening. And, and it was. Yeah. I think, I think I, I watched an interview that you did where you're, and correct me if I'm wrong, where you said, you know, you were trying to script stuff for Tony and then you basically just ended up saying, just say what you've told me before. Just say that to the camera, basically, yeah. you know, and he did. And, um, you know, I watched the film already um, and it's it's amazing. It's incredible. The insight that you get into not only your organization and what you're doing, but then also into, you know, a lot of the different things that's, that these guys are dealing with is so incredible. And the quality of the of the actual film is amazing. And you know, the reason I asked you, you know, and is, is any of your personal experience coming through is because, I mean, for me, it felt like maybe some of it was just because of how raw and hard hitting a lot of that emotion was not only in your character, but, you know, in all the characters from all the veterans that were portrayed, man, right. all, all in all. Yeah. I yeah. mean, we, we, we definitely relate to each other. And, and so while, while Zephyr's story, that's a character's name I played while his story is, his backstory is really a composite of two specific veterans that were kind of built from there. But what he's going through, what he's living is a mix of so many of what we're, you know, feeling and experiencing. And I, I never lived in a homeless shelter, but, you know, I know what it feels like to struggle with moving forward and, and the guilt of feeling like you're leaving people behind yeah. or you're, you, you know, the, the, the guilt of, enjoying your life feeling that you deserve to enjoy your life while some people some some of your buddies didn't make it back or some of them did make it back and are in a really dark place like why do i deserve to be happy i don't that's something that we all want well, maybe not all but a lot of us feel and can relate to and i'm one of those people and so when it came to that part of it like 
that was that was me you know what i mean because yeah. i do feel those things and i didn't have to pretend to uh to to, to feel something or um sort of make a, a substitution in my life that relates to that because I, I i absolutely relate to that experience and um yeah i mean and that's why I, I wanted that's why it was important to me that on screen we're seeing these real people um and so, so people understand not only like that we are capable of doing some really cool stuff outside of the uniform like making movies yeah uh you know as a team but also like i wanted them to you're gonna feel it more when it's real and these people that are talking, these other actors that are vets and the athletes, they've all felt that way. They all have experienced those things and, and it's very real to them. So it's going to be real to the audience. Yeah, it was awesome. And we have a trailer, ladies and gentlemen, um, that you were gracious awesome. enough to send over. So I'm going to go ahead and play that right now, okay? Most of my post-traumatic stress is from lack of traumatic stress. And I missed the locker room. You own a gym. Why not make it a locker room? That's all you got? What if we had some of your dudes come down, get in there with some of my dudes? Pay your asses. Help. 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 Get up. <laughs> I got you. I would give anything to just run out on that field one more time. I would never compare battlefields to ball fields, but the camaraderie, the pride, it's crazy how all that stuff matches up. You're not at war anymore. You gotta move forward. You didn't die. So when are you gonna start living? We can't lose. We're your team now. Awesome. You know what's interesting and so funny is that that first line of the trailer I'm probably going to mess it up, but my, like, what was it? My post-traumatic stress is a lack of traumatic stress that I, I'm not going to say it's verbatim, but that is something I hear all the time from the military yeah. veterans. And I'm not just blowing smoke. It's crazy. Yeah. When I, when you sent it to me, I saw, I was like, seriously, like just well, spot well, on, dude. Spot I heard on. it and I didn't, you know, that's not an original line from Nate. I heard that from, um, a, a, a veteran buddy, you know, guy serving the special special operations. He told me that five years ago, we were on the, we were on, we were on Ventura Boulevard having a conversation on the sidewalk there kind of going opposite ways. And we knew each other and we started talking and um, he said that. And I was like, Whoa, that's exactly what I feel. You right, know what I mean? Right, right. It's like that with every line in the movie. I'm telling yeah. you, like they're, they're not, it's not something, you know, Nate, the writer came up with it's, I heard it from right. other people, right. you know, from other uh, uh, guys I served with or guys I didn't serve with that I've just been around in the, in the, since then. But that one really sticks out to a lot of people. Um, and it's a brilliant line, but it's like, it's so true. And, you know, what so many of us miss is that that uh, traumatic stress. Like, right. it's crazy. And, um, you know, we need to have, I think there, I mean, there's good stress as well, you know, where they call it you stress or whatever. Right. Um, you know, it's important to find that uh, if you had it in the past uh, and obviously do something positive to find that. <laughs> uh, but, but that, that helps us feel alive and helps us, you know, kind of feel that connection to, um, to who we, who we still are. And I don't want to say who we were. Um, and, you know, there's healthy ways to do that, you know, and, and, uh, and that's and that's important, but you know that scene specifically, I won't give it away. But that's not a healthy way to. Yeah, I was <laughs> to gonna say what happened next in that scene. Yeah, um, that sentiment is very genuine. You are, you know, because it's a movie, you figure out a way to impart that traumatic stress onto the and your the NFL vet Mo, who did like an absolutely amazing job, by the way. Mo McCray was yeah. he's an incredible actor. Man. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. So much to this he, as a, as an as as a producer as well. He helped me when he was behind the camera, and I was on camera. You know, he's coaching me up between scenes. Like he he was. Yeah, I'm so lucky to have to have uh, him on the project. He's invaluable. Yeah, he absolutely crushed it. Um, movie's amazing. Excellent job, man. I hope everyone that watches this ends up going and um watching it. And you can get it. I think you mentioned it before. 
you can get it pretty much anywhere you can stream movies, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The main ones people are going on is, is Amazon Prime and and, uh, and Apple TV, iTunes. Uh, but it's uh, it's available several other places. I mean, it's it, it's everywhere. You you can find it. People watching on YouTube. Um, and and yeah, like I said, review it. Please review it. Uh, that's important to do so that so that more people um, can learn about it, hear about it. Uh, but also share it. You know, share it with your community. Share it on social. Share it with friends, family veterans, athletes, um, you know, help us get around. We don't have any money for marketing. This is our, this is our marketing this right here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which is great. I'm really grateful for you guys having us on the show Yeah, um, and talking through all this stuff, but, um, but yeah, everybody can be a part in helping us get MVP out there. Absolutely. Um, before we leave though, um, I want to get you, if you have any, which I'm sure you do, uh, any advice for military veterans that are retired and are in a rut right now, or any NFL vets that might be in a similar experience, obviously go on the MVP website and get connected with this organization. It's an amazing organization, but anything that you could tell them right now? I mean, the number one thing to me is just try things. We've all got interests. We've all got things we're somewhat passionate about. You know, you don't have to worry about picking one thing and then that's just who you are and what you do forever. Um, or for the next chapter, I think you should try a lot of different things unless you know for sure what you want to do. Like I knew storytelling was something that I wanted to do and wanted to get into. And there's various ways to do that. You know, maintaining that balance in my life is important. Um, and, 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 and making sure that's not the only thing in my life. Uh, but I mean, try, try different things. If you have any interests in anything, it doesn't have to be anything that has to do with your prior experience. Like that's one thing a lot of vets fall into that trap of they're like, well, in the military, you know, I, I, I worked in, uh, uh, you know, I was in artillery or whatever, like that doesn't relate to anything. And I'm like, it relates to everything the the, the teamwork, um, overcoming adversity, thinking outside the box, um, planning, preparation, resiliency, um, having to adjust, uh, survive, adapt, all these things that you had to do that so many people, they, they don't have that experience. And especially at the level that you had it, like you have a huge advantage. You can pick anything. It, it doesn't matter if you've never done it a day in your life and start from scratch. I never played football before. I was 29 years old and I made the team eventually got on the field within a couple of years because I worked my butt off. But I, I, um, but I also like, I, I, you know, I transitioned the the work ethic and the skill sets and all those things that I acquired in the military that have nothing to do with football on paper right. to that, you know, and it's the same with anything. Like you can literally do anything. So don't limit yourself. Don't think, well, you know, this is what I was trained in. So that's all I, that's all I can do. It doesn't matter. It's just like we tell this to people when they go to college, like not that it doesn't matter what your degree is in. It should be in something you're interested in, but like you don't have to, you got an engineering degree that's awesome. You don't have to be an engineer, right? You can do something completely different. You know, Yeah. you got a, a degree in English. You don't have to be an English teacher or a writer. You could do anything. I yeah. Mean, it's just that that's the biggest thing. It's just don't, don't put limitations on yourself because um, it's just not fair. And, and you're going to be a lot more capable than most people out there. Yeah. Uh, they definitely didn't teach podcasting in med school. That's for sure. <laughs> um, but also for like organizations like brain sport that deals with NFL veterans and, and military veterans, there's a lot of organizations out there just like ours. I would say, um, the opportunity to collaborate with MVP as an organization, I would encourage not only my own program, but then also all the other programs out there to reach out to your organization to see if, you know, there would be any opportunity, um, you know, there to be able to collaborate. Cause you know, I think that you're filling Absolutely. such an important, um, hole in, in what these guys are going through that we can't necessarily do right. Like we can't pair them up with like NFL veterans or anything like that. So I think, um, collaboration with your organization would be absolutely amazing. Of course, brother. Yeah, yeah. man. Um, a good start. Yeah. 
Thanks so much for joining, buddy. I appreciate it. Thank you, it. I appreciate you, brother. Thanks for sharing your story. I think what you're doing is amazing. I hope that you continue to do it uh, because you really are doing some important work. I'm truly honored um, to have had you on. Uh, of course, thank you for your service. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. Um, and then maybe we'll have you back in person next time. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, buddy. Appreciate thank it, man. Thanks we, so much. We got your back. Yep. We got your back. Yep. Have a good one.